Good morning and welcome to St Mary's. It's really good that you've joined us online for this service. Now, if this is your first time with us, an especially warm welcome. And if you're a regular with us, we're delighted that you're back again. Now, our time together will include some worship, some practical teaching from the Bible and an opportunity for reflection. Now, our prayer is simply this, that we hope that you'll discover more of who God really is and that whatever situation you find yourself in now, you're going to find encouragement and hope to face it. Now this morning we're continuing our new series, Out of the Storm, that is looking at the really vexing question of why there is suffering in the world. Because sooner or later suffering comes to all of us and it's often followed by, can we trust God if he runs things like this? Now I suspect these are topics that hold interest and are very real issues for many people right now. Throughout the Bible we're reminded that whenever we face difficult times, the best thing we can do is to worship God and to offer a him our praise. And so I'm going to begin by reading from Psalm 103 in the Bible. It says, Praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul.
We're living through a season in which many people are experiencing pain, whether that's the pain of physical illness, grief, uncertainty, job loss, conflict, abuse, mental illness, or any other host of problems. Now the list is long, and if you're suffering, you're not alone. Suffering is a universal human experience, yet most of us are innately bad at knowing how to handle it. And we tend to be particularly bad when it comes to our words, when we're there to help others. And despite our good intentions, we can do a great deal of harm in how we respond to someone who's in pain. Now, I'm really glad that you've joined us for this six-part series that we're working our way through the book of Job in the Bible. Job is an important and helpful book because it aids our understanding on questions such as why is there suffering in the world? And because we gain practical advice on how or how not to help others in their pain. If you're not familiar with this book in the Bible, it might surprise you to know how it continues to shape society today. For example, the name Job is used to refer to a rare medical condition which affects the immune system and which can make a person susceptible to skin infections, hence Job's syndrome. Now, if you weren't with us last week, I would strongly suggest you go and listen to the first introductory talk in the series. And then there's the expression, a Job's comforter, to describe a person who discourages or depresses while seemingly giving comfort and consolation to another. Now this is our subject this morning. Job is not an easy book to read, largely because it's long, but it really is worth getting to grips with it as it teaches some important truths about suffering and possibly even more importantly about the nature of God's justice. So this morning, in this second session, we are going to read from chapters 2 and 3, where we're introduced to Job's three friends, or his comforters. So let's read Job chapter 2, verse 11, through to uh, chapter 3, verse 1, and it reads, When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Nathamite, heard all about the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathise with him 
and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognise him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Let be in no doubt, Job is suffering terribly. What follows in chapter 3 is a poem unleashed by Job, revealing his utter devastation. It's a long and elaborate curse about the day he was born. Job is dreadfully alone. He can only look back on his life with bitter regret. He has no sense of hope. And then what follows is a long section in the book, chapters 4 through to 27, which record the heated conversations between Job and his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar, who, as we read, came to sympathise and comfort him. Now, we're only going to be able to look at these chapters in a very general sense this morning. It's like an aerial view. Now, please read them if you can in your own time, as next week we're going to look at one of these conversations in more detail. And to help you navigate this long-winded debate, it goes a bit like this. Job begins speaking. A friend responds. Job speaks again. Uh, this prompts a response from the next friend and so on. I think you get the drift. And this cycle is repeated three times. Job's comforters, as they're ironically known, had a great deal to say, and they stand as an example of how not to speak to someone who is suffering. The row centres around Job and his crippling condition, which is causing him untold pain, and whether it's his suffering is a result of something he has done, and it's something that he's brought upon himself. So, is Job suffering this way because he has sinned? The reason why it's not immediately apparent how to answer this question is that Job and his friends enter into this long, impassioned argument. The comforters aren't very impressed with Job. At one point, for example, Bildad says, How long are you going to go on like this? You sound like a blustering wind. That's Job 8 verse 2. And similarly, Eliphaz, A wise man wouldn't answer with such empty talk. You're nothing but a windbag. That's Job 15 verse 2 in the New Living Translation. But neither is Job impressed with his comforters. Weary of their unhelpful rhetoric, Job tells them, You are miserable comforters, all of you. Job 16 verse 2. And to cap it all, God isn't impressed with Job's comforters either. We discover the nine chapters spoken by Job's friends are littered with stuff that is just plain wrong. Now, their overarching belief was that Job was suffering because he had done wrong, and as a result they repeatedly encouraged Job to admit his wrong and repent so that God would bless him again. But, at the very end of the book, Job 42 verse 7, the Lord says to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. The problem we encounter is that what they say is not total rubbish. It would have been better if it had been because then it would be easier to identify. Instead, their words need to be carefully studied to tease out the errors. So for the remainder of this talk, I'd like and what I want to do is to do two things. I want to look at what we can learn from Job's friends in terms of what they have right and then in what they have wrong. So firstly, what did Job's friends have right? Was it that Job's friends got everything wrong? No, I think we can agree that they got at least three things right. You can see that in Job chapter 2, 11 through to 13. First of all, they showed up. They came to him when he was suffering. Verse 11, showing up and just being there is an excellent response to pain. When we're suffering, we need people who will be with us, just come and be with us, not with an agenda, not expecting us to talk, not coming with perfect answers. We need people who are going to show up and keep showing up. Second, they emphasised, they empathised with him. The text says they came to sympathise, but I wonder if we can give him more credit than that and say that they also empathised with him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads, verse 12. 
Sympathy is sharing the feelings of another. Empathy understands their feelings so that you can enter into it. Empathy says something like, I see you here in this pain and I will sit with you here in it. When and if we do speak, it needs to come from a place of understanding. So, of empathy, it has been said, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Thirdly, they spent time with him. Verse 13 states that they were with him for seven days before they offered their advice. They commiserated with their friend in silence. All too frequently, we talk at people's pain, when in fact it would be better if we just listened. All too often, we chase pain away with our words because it makes us feel better. We try and give quick fixes. Saying, I don't know what to say, I'm just so sorry you're going through this, is fine. Pain is a process. A good guiding principle for us and Job's friends may well be, unless we know what we're talking about, it might be better just to keep our mouth shut and just sit there. Second then, what did Job's three friends have wrong? What did they have wrong? I want to do this by thinking about their pastoral approach and then I want to look at a more specific theological issue of particular interest to Christians because it concerns the issue of sin. First, and I'm calling this the comforter's tone. As we've already said, the dialogue between Job and his friends is lengthy and becomes increasingly heated. The comforters all seem convinced with what they believe. For example, Bildad says in chapter 8 verses 8 through to 10, ask the former generations and find out what their ancestors learned. For we were born only yesterday and know nothing, and our days on earth are but a shadow. Will they not instruct you and tell you? Will they not bring forth words from their understanding? Or say, look at Eliphaz's words in 15 verses 7 through to 10. Are you the first man ever born? Were you brought forth before the hills? Do you listen in on God's counsel? Do you have a monopoly on wisdom? What do you know that we do not know? What insights do you have that we do not have? The grey-haired and the aged are on our side, men even older than your father. Theirs is the logic of tradition and dogma. Theirs is the voice of people who are set in their ways because what has been handed down to them and needs no further testing in their minds, despite all the evidence around them perhaps suggesting the contrary. Their approach reveals a, a lack of sympathy, a lack of concern. Put simply, it lacks love. Their ideals become so important, it actually obscures the person and the situation involved. So it becomes a theoretical problem, not a person's life at stake. The second more specific point that the friends get wrong is theological. It's the question, is Job's condition and his suffering the result of sin? Now, it's a question that all believers ask at different times in their lives, and I suspect non-Christians, although they might, they might have a slightly different emphasis on it. When we suffer, is it because I have done something wrong and sinned? At the heart of the comforter's theology is a logic that undergirds almost everything they say. Simply expressed, it is those who live a wise life obtain favour and those who don't will suffer. And they adamantly hold on to this system. They say, God is in control. God is always just and fair. Therefore, he always punishes wickedness and blesses righteousness. And he does this uh, always and as quickly as he can, and certainly in this life. For if he were to ever do otherwise, it would mean that he was unjust. And, and that just couldn't be so in their system. So, if I suffer, I must have sinned, and I'm being punished rightly for my sin. And likewise, if I'm blessed, I must have been good. Now, this system is not uncommon to other wisdom in the Bible. For example, the book of Proverbs. 
And there's something deep within us, isn't there, in our souls that wants to agree with most of this logic. It's as though it's inbuilt into us. And we naturally want those who are good to prosper and those who are evil to suffer. So what are we going to do with their theological system? Do we dismiss it as stupid? No, because the first two points are true. God is in control and God is just and fair. Further, we also know that we do suffer because we sin. We know that unconfessed sin can damage us and bring feelings of guilt and shame. We know that unforgiveness towards others causes us to become hard and bitter and eats away at us. We know that moral failure, such as committing adultery, damages all those who are caught up in it. We could go on. So, although the comforters may well have a case and be right to appeal to Job to repent, we remember from last week that three times in Job uh, 1 and 2, we're told that Job is blameless. He doesn't need to repent for any sin that has led to this suffering. He's not being punished for sin. So just what is wrong with the Comforter's system of theology? Again, drawing on Christopher Ashe's wonderful short study on Job entitled Out of the Storm, he suggests there are three errors in their system. The first is this, there is no place in their thinking for Satan. We know, having read Job 1 and 2, that the whole tragedy of Job has its origins in a heavenly argument between the Lord and Satan, but the Comforter's have no place for this, for an understanding of a spiritual battle. In their world, evil is an entirely human phenomenon. How wrong they are. The second error is that there is no waiting. They want judgment now. The wicked are punished now and the righteous are blessed now. This is a very neat theology and tidy, but dangerous. From other areas in the Bible, we see that the promises of judgment are not for now. Recall, for example, Psalm 1, in which there's a clear distinction made between the life of the righteous and the wicked, but where we also read that the wicked will not be able to stand at the final judgment. So what do we do with those passages that appear to speak straightforwardly about blessings for obedience and curses following disobedience? We need to recognise the difference between general truths in scripture or principles and absolute every case promises. Thirdly, and finally, there is no place in uh, their system for innocent suffering. At one point in the long-winded conversation, Eliphaz is heard as saying, who, being innocent, has ever perished? In their system of theology, there is no place for the cross. There is no understanding that good can come out of suffering, as Christians actually understand and see supremely demonstrated in Jesus and his death on the cross at Easter, which saw a righteous man suffer so that we might be saved, and the suffering of Christ bringing about the ultimate good. Now, does any of this matter? The answer is, of course, yes. The book of Job is profoundly relevant as the question of Job is a daily struggle for many people right now who are living responsible lives yet are shocked by grief and loss. The message of Job, I want to suggest, enables us to both make sense of such situations and to help us comfort those who are hurting. So shall we pray? Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the message of Job. Father God, we thank you that you haven't left us alone to be bewildered and confused. And although the world we live in is complex, is challenging, is really hard. Lord God, I pray that we might take time to reflect and understand on, on who you are and how your nature uh, unfolds. Lord God, may we be those who see our world from a correct perspective. And importantly, may we also be those that can help and support and comfort those themselves who are suffering. And so I pray all these things in Jesus' name.
Amen. It's now to the place of the cross and Jesus' innocent suffering on our behalf that we will turn to in our worship. We do hope you found your time this morning encouraging and we look forward to being able to welcome you back again. Now, if you'd like to find out more about what happens at St Mary's, please do join us again uh, for other services and all the details are on our website. And please take a moment to fill out one of our Get Connected cards if you haven't done so already. And so you don't miss out on anything, why not subscribe to our YouTube channel? It might be that you're interested in meeting with other Christians in a small group to help you grow in your faith and to make friends. A connect groups offer a great opportunity for doing that. So if that's something of interest to you, please do get in contact with us. And this morning we've heard some challenging things about the importance of, of faith. And if you'd like to explore more about the claims of the Christian faith, Alpha is a great place to do that. So why not consider joining our next course if you'd like to, or you have any questions about it, please email alpha at stmarysperly.org.uk. And again, following on from this service, we will gather on Zoom to connect and meet with others and to reflect on our topic this morning. So once the service is finished, please make yourself a coffee and then join with others online. The connection details will be displayed at the end of the service. But now, I'd like to close with a blessing for Epiphany. Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. 
Amen.